All right, first up, we have a new story, which is central banks join the extinction revolution. Well, only kind of, I think, here. So Fortune.com put this one out there. So central banks are the world's newest climate change activists. Uh, so in a quote that they had, uh, which was an open letter signed by uh, Mr. Mark Carney, who we were just talking about a second ago, no country or community is immune. As financial policymakers and prudential advisors, we cannot ignore the obvious risks before our eyes. And um, there's been lots, I guess, in this in, in the news over the last uh, couple of weeks, really, that I think, you know, putting it scientifically, we're about buggered now, aren't we, from a, a climate perspective. So um, really, you know, the, the sort of pressure is on us to do something about it before whatever we do is uh, actually not going to make any difference. What do you guys think? This is a deep and meaningful one to start FinTech Insider with, right? Well, I think, I think it's interesting that you see uh, central banks and companies taking the lead on this because the sort of political impetus seems to have stalled with, you know, the US pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord. And, you know, the UK are talking about it this week. They've got this very aggressive plan to perhaps go zero emissions by 2050. But this idea of sort of corporate responsibility and having it enforced by regulators, you know, that seems to be what's now taking the reins there. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, corporates have, have, have had CSR policies for many years now, so clean on the inside, and now it's time to think about getting clean on the outside. And there's actually um, a policy statement, um, uh, the enhancing banks and insurers approaching to managing the financial risk from climate change has actually been issued now, and it's going to become part of the uh, SMR uh, as well by October. The, which is the senior managers regime, mm -hmm. which is uh, what the FCA uses to ensure that the senior managers of a given bank mm -hmm. are ensuring certain things are happening so that they can lose their job and they can even end up in prison if something's gone wrong enough. So the, the, the real impact of not doing this in financial services is significant if you're a senior manager of a bank, which suggests hopefully people will start to take this thing seriously. I mean, it does appear that way. Your point about the political in impetus uh, there, uh, Oscar, was, was interesting. It's almost as if uh, in the UK, uh, we almost can't get out of our own way. Everything's kind of frozen because of Brexit. In the US, um, the political momentum has swung towards populism, uh, certainly with, with where power is at the moment. So you can't get something done. So the question is, where does the consumer go? And, and where, do, where do people go? And, and we've seen uh, with uh, you know, kind of the recent activism in London, but you see it around the world, increasingly, though, in the choices that consumers make every day. Not just, it's not the demonstrations here, it's the choices they're making. Ethical is the new luxury. Ethical, if you think about Planet Organic, if you think about everything that is luxury, um, even the challenger banks, they stand out not because they've got a pink card or they're trendy or they're hipster. They stand out because of how ethical and transparent and how they communicate. And I think that's a real shift in, in mindset, in marketing, in, in branding and in everything. But it, that's the, the carrot. You can win new business if you do this well. But the stick is, if you don't do this well, well we're pretty much all screwed. So that I think it's starting to, to come together quite nicely. But this changing how it goes from investments and, and seeing a, a central banker do, it's really interesting. I think it, just to pick on that point as well, it's interesting to see that you're coming, you, it, the pressure's coming from both sides in terms of today we saw both the, uh, no, sorry, yesterday the Bank of England was picketed by climate, climate change protesters. Today, Barclays AGM was picketed by climate change protesters. So that's probably more on the sort of left wing of the spectrum. But at the same time, you've got UBS coming out with these billionaire investor reports, and they're saying they're seeing the new generation of inherited wealth. They're actually very interested in the ESG investment, and their advice, the UBS's advice, is come up with ESG investment opportunities for these new generation who are inheriting the wealth, and they want to improve the world. And they're probably not going to be the left-wing people who are picketing these AGMs. I, I guess the, the challenge here, and to use some of the reasonably 
uh, obvious metaphors on this one. You know, you're talking about the frozen middle. Well, it's not going to be frozen for very long, isn't it? And uh, and I guess is this stuff really like fundamentally just like the tip of the iceberg when it comes to actually what needs to be done? Because we're in a situation where actually is this enough? Like, is this enough to actually stop the reasonably inevitable problems that we're kind of facing into? Because if it is purely a CSR thing, then, you know, most CSR stuff is there for uh, looking good in the papers rather than actually fundamentally doing anything. Um, and actually, uh, I do wonder is, you know, the, the banks are in a bit of a rock and a hard place. And actually, most governments are in a rock and a hard place because most people think somebody needs to do something about this. And most of those people don't think they should do something about this. It's, and that's that's the problem, right? You know, we're, we're in a space where everybody thinks it's somebody else's responsibility. And until a government makes it mandatory that actually we're fundamentally going to change these things, and that can't be with the US walking away from the table or, you know, China pumping all sorts of stuff out in all sorts of places, then... You know, I can recycle as many bottles as you like, but it's going to make bugger all difference. Yeah, yeah there, are, there are certain things that create tipping points and, and momentum. It's interesting, uh, Oscar, you mentioned ESG, uh, environmental sustainability and governance, has become a de facto way of measuring fund performance. You see increasingly now the likes of Nutmeg and Scalable and a lot of these uh, investor platforms, Hargreaves, Lansdowne, are measuring the performance of your fund in terms of how much CO2 is this fund creating? Uh, how much, uh, you know, kind of, is this uh, ethical? And, and sustainable are farmers who are providing the goods underneath this and the supply chain being treated correctly. But that's kind of fine in terms of how a company performs and how it treats people. But if that company is pumping a load of oil, it doesn't matter how nice they are to the to their employees. Like impact is the important thing. Like what are you actually producing? So increasingly you're seeing that shift. And I've looked up a number of studies that suggest and I'll cite them for the show notes. Laura, remind me to do that, please. Um, so check out in the show notes. I promise you will include this study because um, I, I haven't had a chance to look it up, but I remembered when one was looking at this. Um, that there's a no, now emerging evidence that over a three to five year period, um, sustainable and impact-based funds outperform the market. So impact is not just something that is good in, for the planet. It's good for your wallet. Why wouldn't you do this? Why would you not move in this direction? There are consequences to not doing it in terms of the senior management regime. There are consequences in terms of we might go extinct. Um, and then let's remember there's real opportunity here in terms of engaging your customer, engaging the brand, but also actually selling more stuff. Absolutely. And I think an another consequence uh, is likely to be what consumers will start to do as well and start to vote with their feet as more people, as more institutions become more vocal about what it is that they're doing. So, so I think that that's another consideration too. It's, it's going to be an interesting one because yeah. I guess many of these things end up, you know, the, that's an interesting point because many of these things end up uh, being in you know, a planet organic, I end up spending like fifteen pounds for a cup of coffee type thing. But I feel like I'm doing good. Therefore, yeah, I can kind of like the whole food, the whole luxury. paycheck. Thing. I know it's the it, new luxury. pretty much. Yeah, it's the new luxury. So interesting that actually in that instance, you you know, you're saying it's it's better and better. Yes. You know, like so why would you not type thing? But um, you know, like do do you? We're taking this down to a very local level. But do like do you guys all recycle? Like, I hate food bins, but like I'm all I'm all good for recycling. Hey, but do you guys? Me. <laughs> I, I, I buy recycled clothing wherever I can. Do you? Oh, absolutely. My handbags are recycled. I, I, yeah, absolutely. I try to do whatever I can yeah. to be sustainable and have done for years. What about you, Freddie? Make my own coffee every morning, recyclable cup. That's my, uh, my step. And it's, it's small, you know, it's things like that that actually start actually being the things that kind of add up, doesn't it? But I, I do wonder with that where it, if it costs slightly more, will people think that it's a choice they should make? Because there's so many people who don't have that, you know, we're, lucky you know we've got the luxury of of choice and uh, optionality and 15 pound cups of coffee you know like but actually most people don't and but therefore is... is it something that they can choose to do or is it something that actually the again the you know it's like my children would choose to have sweets every day but <laughs> as parents we choose for them not to but this is why this is why how money flows is so important because if you look at 65 percent of the investment market in other words 65 percent of all of the shares all of the bonds that are bought in the markets are bought by either um 45 well, sorry uh, either retail so you and me or pension funds so it's about 45 percent retail and 20 percent pension funds 65 percent of that investment market is retail if consumers and it appears increasingly so really care about this stuff there's an ability to connect to the fact that they care like do you know what your pension is invested in 
Does anybody around the table know that the, the opt-in pension, or sorry, the, the default pension that you have as part of your company scheme, where's that fund going and how ethical are those investments? Because if you knew, I imagine a lot would move. And if a lot moved, imagine what that would mean. Um, and so that's where I think from a fintech perspective, how do you connect that to the everyday spend? So like when I go buy my coffee, like, or buy something at Pret or whatever, I get them real-time notification from modern apps. But wouldn't it be great if it said, oh, you know, you've also rounded up 55p and that's enough to plant two trees. Well done. Like, there's little things in terms of engagement like that and saving for the future we could do that could be really, really interesting. Um, but that data, all of our money is there and it's, it's not being used in these ways. So I think that's a giant opportunity that we're missing to engage people with money they've already got saved that's not doing what they want it to do. Yeah, it's almost the creation of a different currency, yeah. isn't it? So you start to think about the, the, the value very differently. Just a point I wanted to make as you were talking about the coffee, etc. I think the, the high street is always a really interesting barometer of what's happening. So if you look at some of the, the, the you know, very accessible fashion stores out there, they are starting to do quite significant lines of recycled, upcycled um, clothing now. So I think watch this space in terms of it really tipping into uh, you know, the, the mainstream, the everyday sort of salaries. And that fast fashion is such a carbon generator. Um, the uh, cows as well, you know, the fact that we eat red meat is, is such a CO2 generator. There are certain things behaviorally that we do as a society that actually these tiny things, so nudges and defaults, I think thinking about behavioral economics is going to be really interesting. And that's where I get interested from a, from a consumer brand standpoint. If I've already got my sort of fintech and my banking app that's rounding up money from everything I'm spending, what else could I do with that? That really excites me if I'm sitting inside of a financial services company thinking, what do I need to build next? And I think as, as these topics become more and more entrenched in the, in the sort of public psyche, then, then those those things will become more important to people and it will naturally drive the market that way. What, what worries me is that the, the banks and the governments are always going to be sort of reactive to these issues. And, and I, I only hope that with the change in public opinion, they'll, they'll start to be a bit more proactive in the steps that they're taking. We will see, right? Uh, I guess, well, I think from the study I saw, we've got 12 years to find out if we do something or not. And then it's basically... Then it's run away forever yeah. and we're basically screwed. I mean, good luck, kids. Let's see what happens. All right, moving on. <laughs> All right. Uh, next story that we have.